A ship was moving closer to the island. The island was filled with men who would think nothing of killing and then eating another human being. The boat would be dropping off missionaries. Standing on the boat, looking out at the island, was a man, a young woman, and a little puppy. I am back, and it has been a very, very long time. And once again, I find myself apologizing for the very long delay. Life has been wild here this fall. My daughter started university, and my children are growing into these beautiful young ladies. It's pretty amazing. I've also been really busy with my production company, Laurelie Productions, and I have so many great clients, and I've been helping them make their podcasts fantastic. And I just Haven't had time for my own, but I promise I really am trying to change that. My husband and I have also been really busy with his new coffee company, Alexander Henry Coffee, and I love spending weekends at local markets, and I'm so proud of how well his company is doing. And on that note, today's episode is brought to you by Alexander Henry Coffee. And if you use the code CHURCHHISTORY, all lowercase, no spaces, you can receive a 20% discount. Now, I had said previously that we were only available to Canadian listeners, but it is now available in Canada and in the United States. So if you want great coffee, check it out. My husband roasts the coffee, and let me tell you, our house smells so great. And I'm drinking some of this coffee right now, and it tastes so smooth. So check out the link in the show notes. Today, we're finishing up the story of John Payton. Now, we talked about him in our last episode, and you may want to go back and listen to that episode to fully grasp the story we're talking about today. Although I am about to do a quick recap. In the last episode, as well as in this one, we were talking about the life of John Payton and his missionary work in the New Hebrides. In this story, you're going to hear about the violence that was happening on the islands. You're going to hear about cannibalism and violence. And I know that many homeschooling families do listen to this podcast. So I want to make sure you're aware of that before listening, just in case you have younger children. However, I do believe it's important that our children hear these stories. Remember that we can't understand the world today if we don't know how we got here. And we can't give our children a Christian worldview of the world without telling them the history of the church. And that history, church history, is full of difficult things. And these stories are part of those difficult things. So to recap, John Payton was born and raised in Scotland by devoted Christians who had already committed him to serve in foreign missions. He was the oldest of the Peyton's children, and they had 11 children. He left school at age 12 and began working as a map maker, putting in 16 hours a day to work, while also studying and continuing his schooling on his own time. But he was fired from that job when he refused to sign a paper, acknowledging that he would work for the map maker for the next few years. He couldn't do that because he wanted to be available when God called him to the mission field. After leaving that job, he worked for a farmer, and those skills he learned on the farm would help him survive once he made it to the mission field. Later, while working at Glasgow City Mission, he served in the worst parts of the neighborhood, an area called Green Street, where alcoholism, prostitution, gambling, and all other perverted things were the norm. But he worked hard using a hayloft for Sunday evening services. And after just a few years, he went from having six people meeting to over 600. And it was during this time that John faced extreme persecution, including being burned by boiling water and being hit in the head with large rocks. But it was his call to the New Hebrides Islands that changed John's life. And this is where we start today's episode. John and his new wife, Marianne, headed to the New Hebrides Islands. Marianne brought with her her little puppy dog, Coloso. Imagine watching this couple and their little dog land on the island. 
knowing that missionaries had been killed and eaten within hours of arriving on this island. But the young couple made it to the island, made a deal with some of the islanders, and purchased a spot of land to build a house. The New Hebrides were a group of islands, and the Peyton settled on an island called Tana. Another missionary settled on the other side of that island, and we'll talk about that family in a little bit. While building their home, there was a couple who stayed with them and helped take care of them. The island had no peace. They were at constant war, and a fight broke out just one mile from their house, and six men were killed. Their bodies were taken to the river, cleaned, and then the town feasted on their flesh. The next morning, the patients were waiting for their breakfast, and the man who was taking care of them arrived angry. He told them they would not be able to have tea that morning. The town had cleaned the bodies of the men they killed in the river, and now the river was full of blood and could not be used for making tea. The man was not angry that six men had been killed and eaten. He was mad that he couldn't make tea for himself and his company. This experience was eye-opening for the Peyton family. They recognized that killing and eating flesh was such a normal part of their lives that no one was bothered by it. That night, as the Peytons were sleeping, they were awoken by the sound of screaming. They both woke up suddenly and then waited. Eventually, the screaming stopped. The next morning, they found out that one of the six men that had been killed two nights before had a widow, and the town had sentenced her to death. It was customary to kill the wife of a man once he was dead. John wondered, how do you even start preaching the gospel to people such as this? It started with learning the language. Each island had its own language, and none of the islands had a written language. So John learned the language. He also started to create a written language for them. There were two chiefs in the area that liked him and began to help him. Chief Noah and Chief Noka. However, there was one chief that ruled the whole island, and he ruled in terror. He was known as the Devil King. Everyone was afraid of the Devil King because he was so cruel and would kill and torture people for no reason. Very quickly, the Peytons learned that children and women were not considered valuable. Children were left to wander around camp and care for themselves, basically as soon as they could walk. Children were often hurt or killed in accidents, or would simply wander off into the jungle and not return. The women were beaten regularly and strangled to death regularly, especially if the husband died. The women were expected to do the hardest labor, and they had to do whatever the men told them to do without question. John tried to defend the women and asked the men why they were treating the women so horribly. The men told John, if they beat a woman, or if they even kill a woman and eat her, the other woman would then listen to them and not complain about the work they were given. Stealing was part of life on the island. People carried their belongings around them everywhere they went, because people would steal everything and anything, and there was no consequences. Lying and stealing was simply part of everyday culture, so nobody trusted anyone. The tribes were ruled by a religion of fear. They were afraid of evil spirits. They were afraid of the devil. They were afraid of evil in general. And they blamed everything bad that happened on John Payton. The presence of John on the island was responsible for every storm, every lack of rain, or really anything bad that happened. Soon after landing on the island, John and Marianne had a baby boy. But almost immediately after giving birth, Mary came down with malaria. John had built their house in an area on the lower part of the island. This was the area where there were so many mosquitoes. John had not known that this was the wrong part of the island to build his house. Mary Ann lay dying in her bed. She spoke to John. She told him she did not regret her choice to marry him. She did not regret coming to the island. She had already come to love the people, even though they did not love her back. She told John to not give up, to keep loving the people. When Mary Ann died, John had to dig her grave by himself. He was also sick with malaria, 
and in his sickness and grief, he worked outside in the hot sun, digging the grave of his wife, and then taking her body and putting it into the grave, all alone. He covered her grave with stones and with coral from the ocean. He was now alone with his baby boy. After a few months, his little boy also came down with malaria, and John, who was still sick himself, tried as hard as he could to care for his little baby boy. But the little body could not handle the high fever, and soon John was digging a grave for his little boy as well. He sat there, on the grave, covered with coral, and felt as though he would die himself, right there on the grave. It was their little dog, Caluso, that was his only comfort. In the area, there were people called the Candlewood Traders. These were white men who came to the island to trade, and they hated the islanders. They would brag about the islanders they had killed, and they would purposely try to screw the islanders out of their land and resources. The islanders believed that all white people were the same as the Candlewood traders. You see, they saw them as all being from the same tribe. Now, when one member of a tribe did something to a member of a different tribe, the whole tribe would go to war. In the eyes of the islanders, the Sandalwood traders and the missionaries were part of the same tribe. So they held the missionaries accountable for the actions of the Sandalwood traders. When drought came and the fields started to fail, the islanders blamed John Payton, so the tribe surrounded his home and planned on killing him. His sacrifice would appease the evil spirits, and then the spirits would send rain. John stood in front of the mob that was ready to kill him. He told them, First, before you kill me, let me pray and ask God for rain. John prayed, and God sent rain. So the tribe decided to let John live, for now. But then, it rained so much that it turned into a huge storm and the rain caused a flood. And shortly after the flood, there was a hurricane. So John was blamed again. If his God sent the rain, then the flood and the hurricane must have also come from his God as well. So they wanted to kill him. So here was John, alone on the island, with only his little dog to keep him company. Through the nights, he would grieve for his wife and son. And during the day, he was trying to set up a mission and trying to survive. Death, murder, cannibalism, stealing, these were all common daily occurrences. One night, seven men were killed in a fight. The men were all eaten, and then their wives were all strangled to death. One night, John heard that the chief was sick and he knew he would be blamed for the sickness. He expected that he would be ordered to be killed. But the chief ordered the execution of six women in the village. The women were killed, and the town ate them. This was considered a sacrifice to the evil spirits. And then the chief recovered. After some time, some of the men in the tribe did begin to listen to what John was telling them about God. Some even said that they wanted to become Christians but they were afraid of how the other men in the tribe would treat them. But there was one man who did come to Christ. His name was Abraham, and he would become John's closest friend and companion. Abraham was his gift from God. For the first time in a long time, John had a friend other than his little dog. Abraham grew in Christ, and his wife also came to Christ. Finally, John felt like he was no longer alone. Just when things were starting to look up, John came down with malaria again. He was so sick, he could feel himself dying. But instead of being alone, he had Abraham with him. Abraham and his wife took John into their home and they cared for him. John knew that he was dying. He said goodbye to his friends. He told them to keep the work going, not to give up. And then he felt himself fade away. But Abraham and his wife would not give up on John. They continued to care for him until he recovered. When John awoke, he was shocked to realize he was still alive. He was sure he had felt himself dying. He told Abraham he realized when he woke up 
that he could not be killed until God was ready to take him home. This realization gave him courage to continue with his ministry. Soon, more people came to Christ, but the other tribe members were not happy about this. They attacked any man who came to Christ. One man was praying, and while he was praying, he was hit in the head from behind and killed. Things were so hard for John. He did have Abraham, his wife, and a few other men who had come to Christ. But the work was so hard. But then it got much harder. The sandalwood traders came up with a plot to kill as many of the islanders as they could. They told one of the islanders they had a present for him on their boat. When the man came onto the boat, they grabbed him and threw him in a cage. They starved him, and then they put a prisoner in his cage with him. The prisoner had measles. Once they knew that the man had contacted measles, they released him and sent him home. He infected the tribe, and it spread quickly. Tribe members who wanted to avoid getting sick fled to nearby tribes, only to infect them as well. The tribe where John was working became infected, and 13 of John Payton's friends who had come to Christ were killed. The measles spread to nearby islands as well. By the time they finally got it under control, one-third of the people on every island had died from measles. So many people died, and there was no one to take care of the bodies. So there was simply massive piles of bodies, and the rotting flesh caused other diseases to spread. The islanders knew the traders had brought the sickness and had purposely infected the tribes. They considered this an act of war. And for the first time, all the tribes were united and turned their anger on every white person. They vowed they would kill every white person, including John, even though John had been caring for the sick and had saved many other lives. One of the missionary families that was living on the other side of the island was captured, killed, and eaten. When the news reached the area where John was living, the whole town began to celebrate. They were dancing in the streets. John was shocked to see some of the men who had become Christians, who were being discipled by John, dancing and celebrating with the rest of the tribe over the killing of the missionaries. He pulled them aside and asked how they could be celebrating this. Then the men told him they could either join the celebration or be killed themselves. And they were too afraid to stand with John. He was going to be killed and they were not going to protect him. Only Abraham stood with John. The tensions continued to build, and soon John knew he would have to escape the island. He would travel across the island to the other missionary family, the Mathesons, and they would have to try to escape the island together. He said goodbye to Abraham, and he left his little dog with his friend. He didn't know if he would ever see either Abraham or his dog again. John traveled at night, and during the day, he hid in the trees and slept. Finally, we made it to the area where the Mathesons lived. But what he found was a very broken man and woman. Their only child was among the dead. When they buried their son, they felt as if their own lives had ended. In an act of grace, God sent a ship to pass by the island. The ship stopped and agreed to take the missionaries, but they had to leave right away. If they waited, they were afraid the tribes would attack the ship. John was eager to get on the boat, but Mr. Matheson ran into his home and locked himself in his office. Mrs. Matheson was crying and begging her husband to come out. John was shocked. He told Mrs. Matheson, leave and go and get on the boat. I will make sure your husband makes it on the boat. But Mr. Matheson would not leave his office. He told John he would stay on the island and let the islanders kill him. John was angry. He told them, what you're doing is suicide, and that is self-murder. But Mr. Matheson didn't care. He refused to leave. Just take my wife and leave. Let me die here. John sat down on a chair. If you're going to die here, so am I. So, when we stand before God in a few minutes, I hope you're ready to explain to him why I am dead when God sent a boat to save me. Are you ready for that conversation? Is that really how you want to meet God tonight? After a few minutes, the door opened and Mr. Matheson came out. All three made it onto the boat. 
and they sailed away from the island. John watched as the island disappeared out of sight. He had spent years trying to reach the people. His wife and child had died. The few men who had come to Christ had cowered and joined the mob. Only Abraham and his wife stood strong, and now he was leaving. It was not a successful mission, and things continued to get worse. On the boat, Mrs. Matheson became ill. She passed away just days after becoming sick. Her husband could not bear the pain of losing another person. He soon became sick as well, and with no desire to live, his body didn't fight the illness, and he died shortly after. When the boat landed in Australia, John walked onto the shores of Australia, a man alone. He didn't even have his little dog with him anymore. As John traveled and spoke in churches in Australia, Scotland, and England, people called him a failure. He was told he should have died on the island with the other missionaries. Why did he survive when the other missionaries didn't? Did he abandon them to die? John continued to preach and tell his stories, and he told them he planned on returning to the island, but he wanted more missionaries to come with him. One of the women he met was a woman named Margaret, and she wanted to go to the islands and serve, and the two were married. In 1865, a boat called the Day Springs left the dock in Sydney, Australia. The boat had been given to John, and the boat was full of men and women who wanted to travel with him to the islands and spread the message of God's love. They knew they could be giving up their lives, but they did so willingly. John and Margaret took the day spring ship from island to island in the New Hebrides, leaving missionaries on each island. Eventually, John made it back to his home. He was excited that he would be able to see Abraham again, but what he learned was that while he was away, Abraham had died. And on top of that, his little dog had passed away too. John was grieving over the loss once again. John and Margaret started a new mission, this time though they were on a different island. They found an area where they wanted to build a home. They paid the islanders for the land and began to build a house. Once again, John was saddened to see the way children and women were treated. He was especially devastated to see so many little children being killed. John and Margaret built two orphanages, one for girls and one for boys. They told the people they could bring their children to the orphanage instead of killing them. Almost immediately, the orphanages were full. These children were raised to love Jesus Christ and grew to become pastors and missionaries that would eventually change the islands. While raising the orphans, John was also creating a written language for the new tribe. One day, while John was working, he realized he needed a tool from his home. He picked up a piece of nearby wood and wrote a note on it. He asked one of the men who was helping him, please bring this piece of wood to his wife. Why am I bringing this piece of wood to your wife? It will tell her what I need. That is crazy. Pieces of wood can't speak. It will tell her what I need. Trust me. The man finally agreed, although he was angry. He went to Margaret, handed her the piece of wood. She looked at it for a few minutes and then went over to a tool John needed and handed it to the man. The man was shocked. How did this piece of wood talk to Margaret? He rushed back to John and asked him, Explain how this piece of wood can talk. John explained it was through written words and that God spoke to us the same way. And there is a way that we can get a message from God. The man became so excited about this. He was soon John's helper in creating the written language. And he helped John translate the Bible. He was so excited that he would be able to read messages from God. Things were getting better. But still, almost every day, somebody tried to kill John. So John came up with a plan. He would hug any man who came to kill him. He would literally run up to them, hug them, and not let them go until eventually they gave up and would walk away. There were so many plots to kill John, and often the children from the orphanage would hear the plots. They would come and tell John or Margaret. The islanders couldn't understand why John was always prepared for their plots, and they never figured out it was the children who were saving his life. The town continued to fear the devil and evil spirits, and the spirit they feared the most 
was a spirit they called Tipolo. They believed that Tipolo could transform himself into a serpent and could speak into their ears, telling them to do evil things. One day, a man in the village killed a large sea serpent, and the village was so excited. They believed Tipolo was finally dead, but they kept thinking about doing evil things. John told the people what they had killed was an animal. They had not killed a spirit. He told them the story of Satan tempting Eve in the garden and how sin entered the world. He told them the only solution was through Jesus Christ. The people listened, but they did not believe. Then a drought came, and the people were getting sick because there was no fresh water to drink. John decided to try and dig a well. The islanders came to see what he was doing, and they laughed at him. Rain doesn't come from the ground. Everyone knows that rain comes from the sky. The islanders surrounded John and watched him dig, laughing at him. But John kept digging and digging. But he started to think perhaps he had made a mistake. There didn't seem to be any water, and he was looking foolish to the islanders. He prayed, and he felt God was telling him, keep digging. So he kept digging and digging and digging. Then, suddenly, water started to sputter out of the well. The town stood in shock. John tasted the water. It was fresh water. It wasn't salt water at all. It was the best water he had ever tasted. He gave some to the people standing around. They couldn't believe how amazing it tasted. John told them this water would not run out, and the more they drank, the better the water was going to taste. The chief talked to John. He said, When you preach your next sermon, I will stand up and I will give the sermon. John didn't know what the chief was going to say, but he allowed him to speak. So the chief stood up. My people, the world is turned upside down. The rain came from the ground. Friends, no one could have ever convinced us that rain could come from the ground. We had not seen and tasted it for ourselves. I know in my heart that Jehovah does exist. Just like we could not see the rain under the ground, but the rain was there. We just couldn't see it. Just like that, we cannot see Jehovah, but I know he is real. From now on, I will be a worshiper of Jehovah, the one who sent Jesus to us. I will be a follower of Jesus. Now, everyone, go get your idols. We will burn them all today. Jehovah sent us Jesus, just like he sent us water. We will follow only Jesus from now on. After years of preaching and teaching, it was this one sermon given by the chief that changed everything. The islanders went to their homes. They got their idols. That day, they left behind their superstitions, and they turned their eyes to Jesus. All of their idols were burned, and that day changed everything. Overnight, the island changed. People stopped stealing and lying. Law and order was established. Eventually, schools and churches were built. Everything was different. And the church was an example of what it means to be saved by grace. Almost everyone in the church had murdered someone. Many had killed little children or even babies. Here's an example of one such story. A man and his woman had been trying to have a baby. However, the wife could not have children. One day, the man came home with a new wife. She already had children, and she was already pregnant with this man's child. The wife was upset and said there was no way she was okay with a second wife. So the man shot her and killed her, then married this new woman. Now this man, his wife, and their children had come to know Christ. They were saved by grace. They had more children, and this large family was serving in the church. The whole church was full of stories such as this. John and Margaret had children also, and their son, Frank followed in his father's footsteps and began working in the New Hebrides island. Frank returned to the island of Tana. This was the island that John had first worked on. During Frank's ministry in Tana, the entire Tana population came to Christ. The spot where John's first wife and son were buried was the spot where Frank would go and visit, a reminder of the seed planted 34 years earlier. Today, the islands of New Hebrides is a 82% Christian, 
and it's one of the safest spots in the world to visit. People vacation there to enjoy the beautiful coral and the amazing scuba diving. Recently, someone asked me how I could believe in a god who would allow a person like Jeffrey Dahmer to be admitted into heaven, but a woman who died in a car accident saving her children was condemned to hell. The idea that someone evil could get into heaven simply by believing in Jesus seemed impossible. The person said to me, I don't want to go to a heaven if people like Jeffrey Dahmer are there. But you see, that's the amazing thing about heaven. We don't have to do anything to get to heaven. It's not based on our works at all. Nothing we do or don't do sends us to heaven. It's only through the grace of God. It's God's free gift to us. The church where John Payton worked on the island was a perfect example of this. There were murderers, thieves, liars, but God took their sin and gave them his righteousness. When God looked at them, he only saw the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And God can do the same thing for you, no matter what you have done or no matter what you have not done. When you turn to Christ, and you ask him to forgive you of your sins. It is a free gift. There is nothing that you can do to earn it. God will take your sin and he will exchange it with his righteousness. And then when God looks at you, you will only see the perfectness, the perfect righteousness of Jesus. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Church History and I will be back hopefully as soon as possible with another episode. But in the meantime, you can check out my website for other episodes, for other podcasts, for videos, all kinds of great stuff at lauraleesiemens.com. And I'll see you again soon.